Hello YouTube, in my last video we created this rather small fluid simulation using SPH and this simulation supports around a thousand particles fairly easily. In this video we'll add about a 30 to 60x performance boost to the particles and I was able to run the simulation containing around 60,000 particles fairly easily. This piece of code is the culprit for the performance issues. Essentially we're comparing every particle with each other which is an n squared time complexity algorithm. To bring this down we'll only compare the neighbors of the particle when running the simulation. Sounds easy, right? But since this code is running on the GPU, we'll have to employ a few tricks to get this to work. Traditionally, what you could do on the CPU is attach a grid number to each particle, then go through each particle and get a list of its neighbors and then attach it to the particle object. However, on the GPU, we don't have dynamic memory allocation like this, so we have to think about a different approach. Without dynamic memory allocation, we have the following issues. We don't want to constrain the simulation to a finite grid, but we don't have infinite memory. We don't know how many particles can be inside of a cell at once, and imposing a limitation can lead to accuracy issues. In order to tackle these issues, NVIDIA presented an idea in the 2008 GDC called Dynamic Hashed Grid Algorithm. The concept is to break our fluid boundary into a grid with each tile the size of the radius of the particle. Then we run a hashing step which finds which cell the particle is in using some simple math. Then we flatten the three-dimensional tile into one number between the range of zero and the number of particles in our simulation. Now this is where it gets interesting. We use a GPU sorting technique called Bitonic Merge Sort in order to sort our particles in parallel based on the cell number. Now we know that all particles in a cell can be found together within the particles array. The final step is to create an array which represents each cell. It will also be the same size as the number of particles because remember due to our hashing function we can only have n amount of cells. This array will contain the starting index in the particle array which houses the particles in that cell. Now with this data structure, we only have three arrays, each of which are of size n, but they can occupy a large number of particles and tiles. And using these arrays, we can get the neighbors for any particle. For example, for this particle, we can do the following steps. First, get the grid cell of the particle, for example, 3, 2, and the neighbor grid cells as well. Then for each cell, we check the cell offset array for an index indicating where the particles for that cell are. Then we go through the sorted particles array, starting at the found index and run the simulation for each particle until the cell index doesn't match anymore. Now here's a big drawback. The hashing function that you use may contain hash collisions, meaning two different grid points can have the same hash. This means that there will be inefficiencies as you could compare a grid cell that actually isn't a neighbor. While this may seem problematic, it's far better than comparing every single particle in that simulation. When visualizing this, I've marked the red sphere as a particle and the green spheres are all the detected neighbors of the red particle. You'll see that it always accurately accurately identifies actual neighbors, but also has false neighbors for the ones out here too. The first step is to change the thread group size from 100 to 256. The main reason is that the Bitonic merge sort that we'll use only works on collections with sizes that are powers of 2. First let's change the dispatch functions in the SPH script, then mirror the changes in the SPH compute shader. Let's also update the num to spawn from 10 by 10 by 10 to something that's a multiple of 256, like 16 by 16 by 16. Let's also ensure that the spheres can be seen and disable the ray marching shader to accurately determine if our optimization is working or not. The ray marching shader itself is very unoptimized and we won't be covering how to optimize that in this video. If I play this now, you'll notice that it's running at about one frame per second, which is honestly fine for me, but some people may complain. So let's get into fixing that. In the SPH script, let's create three different compute buffers. The particle indices compute buffer will store the sorted particle array indices because we don't want to be moving around large structs in memory while sorting. So instead, we can just shift around these integers. The particle cell indices buffer will store the hashed cell index for a given particle. And finally, the cell offsets buffer will store the starting index in the particle indices buffer where the particles in that cell are stored. Let's initialize these buffers in the awake method. Then let's provide these buffers to the kernels that need it. Initially, both the compute forces and density pressure kernel will need each of these buffers. Now in the compute shader, let's create the hash particles kernel and also define each of the compute buffers we made. 
Let's also change the particle length variable from an int to a uint, which will help us in calculations later on. A uint is just an unsigned integer, so we have more space to store positive integers. Before we write the hash particles kernel, create a get cell function that takes in a particle position and returns a cell vector, where each cell is the size of the particle radius. We're adding box size divided by 2 to ensure that there are no negative cell indices. After that, let's create the hash cell function that takes in a cell index and hashes it to the range of 0 to the particle length. This process is called binning, where we take a seemingly infinite range of values and squish it into a finite range. This process is what allows us to have an infinite grid size without having infinite memory. This function will inevitably have hash collisions which will lead to inefficiencies. This hash function uses three large prime numbers to generate an integer and using the modulus operator we bring it back to the range of zero to number of particles. Finally, let's create the hash particles kernel. First, we'll clear the values in the cell offsets buffer, each frame by setting a really high number. Then we'll get the cell through the particle position, hash it, and store it in the particle cell indices buffer. And that's all we have to do in this function. Now in the SPH script, let's create the hash particle kernel and link it in the setup compute buffers function. Finally, let's dispatch it before all the other kernels in the fixed update function. Now that each particle has a cell number attached to it, let's sort the particle indices based on the cell it's located within. The point of the sort is to ensure that particles within the same cell are near each other within the particle indices array. This makes it easier for us to access them. To do this, let's create a bitonic sort kernel in our compute shader and add two properties that we'll need to conduct the sort. The exact details of how the sorting algorithm works are more detailed, so I'll link this YouTube video down below if you're interested. Now let's write the following Bitonic sort kernel. To complete the sorting algorithm, let's head back into the SPH script and first create a sort kernel and set it up like usual. Let's attach the particle indices and particle cell indices buffers to it. Then let's write a method called sort particles like this, which will partition the particles and dispatch multiple bitonic sort kernels to sort the particle indices in parallel. Let's call the sort particles method in the SPH script straight after hashing them in the fixed update. We have just one more kernel to write. This one is to store the cell offsets. Now that we know that the particles in the same cell are near each other in the particle indices list, we just have to store the first particle index for each cell. To do this, we'll loop through the particles and find its cell. Then we'll use the special function called interlocked min, which atomically sets a minimum value at a destination. Here we're comparing what's in the cell offsets array already and the current id.x. Note that this is why we cleared the cell offsets to a large number like 9999 at the very first kernel. This interlocked min call will result to the cell offsets storing the lowest particle index that resides within that cell. Like usual, let's go back to the SPH script and create the kernel, set up the buffers and dispatch it after sorting in the fixed update. Now that all the hard work is done, we just have to update our existing kernels to use our new system. First, let's start with the compute density pressure kernel. Let's do the following things. First, get a particle index from the particle indices array and change all of the id.x indices to particle index. Next, let's get the current cell index for this particle. Then let's create a double nested for loop that goes from negative 2 to 2 to indicate cells around our current cell in three dimensional space. Within the loop, let's get the neighbor cell and its hashed cell index. Now we need to get the particles within this neighbor cell. To do this, let's start an iterator at the index indicated by our cell offsets array. Create a while loop that starts at the offset and goes through until we hit our placeholder maximum indicating no particles in this cell or we go over the particle length. 
Within this loop, we'll get the index of the particle in the neighbor cell and check it's the actual cell index. If the cell index is not the current cell, then we will break. If all of these tests pass, then we have a particle candidate that we can run our existing physics calculations on. Then at the end, make sure to increment the neighbor iterator variable or you'll get an infinite while loop. Now, the last nine steps I just listed out, we're gonna do the exact same thing again to the compute forces kernel. And this is what that looks like. And just like that, you're done. Let's head back into Unity and check out what we have. With the higher time step like 0.06, you can get less accurate but even faster simulations of larger quantities of particles. Here I'm running up to 65,000 particles fairly easily and this is pretty impressive compared to our original 1000 limit. Just a little gem for those who want to visualize properties of the fluid like pressure. In our grid particle shader file, we can add this code to visualize properties like pressure via color. Thanks for watching guys, I hope that answered any questions you had about how to optimize this code. There's a little more you could probably do such as removing that triple for loop. And uh, if you enjoyed this, please leave a sub and a like. I got some more cool ideas I'll be posting here soon. Take care.